Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 4th, 2020, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time, busy schedule to be here, and I am humbled by your presence. Well, this slide is old, but we are going to talk about a lot of the same things. Obviously, current market conditions, and that's we're going to spend a lot of time on that. I want to talk about the leaders becoming laggards and laggards becoming leaders, and maybe being able to have your cake and eat it too, which would be phenomenal. And that's got me pretty excited about the markets. I'm actually short right now, the index stuff, but that's just a, a short term thing. And I want to follow up a little bit on, on volatility. And I want to talk a little bit about going back to the well and taking profits and a plethora of other things. So I have lots to talk about. So let's just hop right into it. Before we do all that, that's the, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. I was all to sum it up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I've been doing these bear market updates, but now I might have to change them to bull market updates. NASDAQ's almost at brand new highs today, notwithstanding, of course. But you can find those on my website. And it might be, if you can't sleep at night, it might be a good exercise. All kidding aside, it might be a good exercise just to kind of see how things shook out and didn't necessarily implode. But what I was seeing and when I was seeing it. Chewy was recommended a while back in the trading service. And it was actually a discretionary call because the market was up huge pre-market. Futures were up at like 100 points or something ridiculous. And or maybe 50 points, I don't remember. And it had a fast move on the open and it triggered, but then it came back in. So I told everybody to use a little discretion, but what I do personally is I try to follow the service mechanically as possible, except of course, when you have an opening gap reversal like that or a potential opening gap reversal into works or a fast move on the open. So I didn't take the original trade, but I did get in when it began to break out and go higher. Now you might think, well, it's too many days into pullback, but lately we've had such strong stocks that I've been a little bit more lenient about days in the pullback. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. Anyway, it was Chewy. That was the entry. That was a stop. And that was the initial profit target. Let's take a look at that. And by the way, if you want to look at these archives, go to DaveLander.com slash archives. If you're, well, whether you're on a trading service or not. In other words, it's not behind a firewall. And you can see everything that I've recommended, warts and all. And again, if you have the time and energy, I would recommend you go in and look at it, as many of those as you can stand. And that way you'll see how things work, good, bad, and indifferent, and get a feel for things. I got a lot of people that start the service and not a whole lot's going on, and they quit within a month or so. But if they would just take a look at what we did in prior months and just stick around for the next month, not that they should be looking for action, but they certainly would see plenty of action. How many times I have to tell you? Every Thursday, I do a week in charts. Anyway, the archives are here. And if you go down here, you'll see that this is the exact trading service I put out every day. And you know, in a lot of these, and I know it'd be pretty painful to actually go through most of them or quite a few of them, but in a lot of these, I use it as a, a teaching example and I'll teach what I'm seeing and sometimes what I'm learning each day in the market. So I'd encourage you to check that out. So the original entry was right here. It might be moved over to the right a little bit. I forget exactly which day it triggered. And then the stop was down here. Luckily, it did not stop out for those who took it without any discretion. My re-entry was here, would have begun to break out again. And then the profit target was up here, as you just saw in the spreadsheet. And so far, so good. It's banged out that profit target today. Now, I've been talking a lot about volatility, and as I've said quite a bit, it can be a rabbit hole where you start getting into volatility, and it's it looks a lot cooler than it is sometimes. It's like you can see these perfect little market bottoms, and, but once you really get into it, sometimes you'll see that they don't line up perfectly. And again, it can be a rabbit hole, and I spent many years going down that rabbit hole doing a tremendous amount of research on volatility. Now, 
this was not a complete exercise of futility. I learned a lot about the markets in the process. So as I've been saying, we have this drop-off effect with the volatility. And the 50-day volatility, as you can see, took a while to drop off. It, did not, it didn't really start dropping off significantly, although it did flatten out, as you can see. And that's the orange line. It didn't drop off significantly until mid-May, and that's because of the so-called drop-off effect, because you're dropping off all those crazy sell-off days we had back in February and March. And you're adding in the more recent times where the market is just kind of slowly working its way higher. As a general statement, when a market kind of grinds higher, as it has been lately, today notwithstanding, volatility will begin to drop off. Now, as a general statement, markets top on low volatility and bottom on high volatility. But as I said a second ago, you got to be kind of careful when you're using that as your timing mechanism because it can be long lead and lag times, but it still is useful. And then there's some other little anomalies, he tried to say, such as when you have a base breakout on low volatility and then it comes right back in and takes out the bottom of the base. In other words, you get that volatility expansion in one direction. Sometimes the real move happens in the other direction. And I've been watching that happen on a variety of time frames. And if you ever see, as Haggerty used to call it, Kevin Haggerty, rest in peace, the Slim Jim, where you have a market just go sideways for a while in a really, really narrow range. If you watch those and you watch the breakout of that, and then you look to fade it as it comes back through the other way, or just look for a regular base in the overall market, and then look to fade it after it breaks out, then it comes back in and takes out the bottom of the base. And that's something I've been worried about or concerned about in the S&P 500. We were in this base, I was concerned, and with the volatility dropping off, we get an expansion to the upside, fake everybody out, and then take out the downside of the base. And that didn't happen exactly. But it did do some interesting things. It did actually bounce off the top of the base, sell off hard, like it looked like it was gonna break out of the base a few times, then sold off hard, it looked like it was gonna break down out of the base and then took off again. So it did quite a few gyrations. As I often say, the market will do what it has to do to fool the most amount of people. Anyway, TF10, TFM 10% system, this is pretty amazing to me. One thing that I learned by watching this thing in real time, it's one thing to go in and do these, this longer term mechanical testing, which I like to do by hand, as I wrote recently in the, in the Facebook group. It's one thing to go through this, and on a weekly system like this, you're going ahead bar after bar after bar. I know I said this last week, but each one is a week, and before you know it, you've gone through 52 bars, in other words, one year's worth of trading, and you do that in about a minute if it takes you even that long, maybe 30 seconds. And you don't realize living through it, that could be a long, long time. And one thing that I didn't realize with this TFM 10% system is if you have a V-shaped recovery at high levels, it's not going to catch up to the market. Whereas if you do have a nice longer term bear market and it bottoms out, not that I want a bear market, I'm talking nice in terms of technical analysis. But you have a nice bear market where it bottoms out like a 2002, 2003, where it took two years to bottom, the signal's able to catch up much, much quicker. So here's the 10% buy line. And that just means that if the market is above the buy line, it is within 10% of its all time highs. I'm sorry, within 10% of its 50 week highs. If it's below the buy line, then it's more than 10% away from its 52, 50-week highs. It's such a simple system, and I always trip up on my words when I go talk about it. Anyway, we're back above that again. Isn't that amazing? We just sold off really hard, and now we're back, we're back within 10% of the old highs. That's buy number one. You have to be above the buy line. And the second rule is you need two weeks of Landry light, and now we have one week, and that's the 50-week moving average. If you get bored, play with this on a daily chart. I think it does show some promise. I just wanted to create a little bit of a longer-term trend-following type of system just to see how it shakes out. And so far, it's been pretty cool. Now, the other thing, too, is 
Although the goal, obviously, goal with all this stuff is to beat buy and hold. My goal with that TFM 10% system, as I've said ad nauseum, is to avoid the big diaper change moment. So if a market drops 10% and it, let's say it's going to go to down 50% or 60%, it'll drop 10% first. So if a market drops 10% and is below the 50-week moving average, you just get out of the way. Now, we had a weekly bow tie sell signal, as I've been preaching for the last 10 years, I guess, or 15 years. When you get these weekly sell signals, you really want to pay attention because some major bear markets have started with these weekly signals. Now, depending on how liberal you are with your entry, as far as I'm concerned, this one really didn't trigger because it didn't really sell off that far past the pullback that we had in here. And as I've said in recent weeks, anything above, let's say, 3,000 or so would be good in Tarzan speak, and even 2,950 or so because the moving averages are coming together and pointing up, or will come together and point up as long as the close is above the moving average, and they will come together and point down when the close is below the moving average. So anything above 29.50 or so is good because, in Tarzan speak, those move, it'll force those moving averages to turn back up, especially the exponential, at least early on. As I often preach, which I learned from Greg Morris, an exponential moving average will turn the same period, whether it's a five-minute chart or a five-week chart or a five-whatever chart, it'll turn the same period that the close crosses above it for upside or will turn down if the close goes below it. So again, downside would be anything, let's say below this 2750 or so number, and that would be not good. Now, the reason I'm showing this in Tarzan speak, which we came up with Tarzan a few weeks back, or I came up with him, is because people seem to want to line in the sand, like, oh, well, when will you be bullish and when will you be bearish? And it's like, well, those are two good reference points. And it also dovetails in with the little range that we've been stuck in. Now, here's a 200-day moving average, which, like I talked about last week, a lot of technicals sometimes come together at the same point. So the 200-day moving average came down to the top of that trading range that we were stuck in for quite a while, felt like forever. And now we have Landry Light above the 200-day moving average. So that is a good thing. Now, we did have this death cross a while back, but it didn't materialize. As I've said quite a bit, taking these death cross and golden cross setups in and of themselves is probably not a good idea because there's a lot of lag in the signals. And by the time the market gets all the way back, back up and crosses over, it's already exceeded where that signal occurred. But the thing to watch for, and you can use your favorite moving average, such as the 200-day moving average or weekly bow ties or daily bow ties, if you're below those signals or lines or whatever you want to call them, that's where bad things can happen. So you have to not necessarily have a line in the sand, but have a point or a signal where you know that something bad could happen. So if something bad's gonna happen, something sort of bad will happen first. In other words, you'll get a sell signal first or a moving average crossing or something like that, and you wanna pay attention to it. Now, in this particular case, the market actually started going up for the most part after the death cross, after a little bit of a sell off, so that signal obviously didn't work. But if you go back in history, and I've done this before, and somewhere there's a spreadsheet. I do all this work, and I just have to get it organized so I could find it again. But somewhere I did a spreadsheet where I showed the maximum move after signals, especially like the death cross, because everybody gets all excited about that. And you do have some pretty serious moves below it. So just go back and look at 2000 or 2007, and I'm sure you had some really big moves below the death cross. So it's a magnitude of what happens 
and not the mechanical system in and of itself. And I think there's only a slight edge. Rob Hanna, who does a lot of mechanical testing, I think he said it was like 4% or something like that, if even that much edge. And it's not that big of an edge longer term. Anyway, like I just said, bad things can happen down here. I think it's uh, Gayard and Maleo were the first to talk about that. And they've talked about how bad things could happen below the 200-day moving average. And it's kind of interesting. Gary Kalbaum calls the area between the 50 and the 200 no man's land. And it's like the market just tries to find its way, tries to find its way, tries to find its way. And now it's broken out above that 200-day moving average. And now you have Landry Light above it. So it's obviously improving. Now, obviously, if we pull back into that range, anything below, let's say, 3,000, then I would begin to get concerned again. Now, somebody a few weeks back, and I tried to pinpoint exactly when it was. I think it was more than a few weeks back, but somebody said, you're bearish, now you're bullish. Well, I didn't really want to label myself as bullish, but I was seeing setups on the long side. and as I often preach, I am set up driven in what I do. And if I'm seeing a bunch of shorts, I'll start trading and recommending shorts. If I see a bunch of longs, I'll start trading and recommending longs. Now, as a general statement, the market is going up and like the hokey pokey, that's what's being that's what that's what being a trend following moron is all about. I had a friend stop by yesterday and he bought he brought over a friend and his friend was like hey uh you trade your trader it's like i did a little trading myself and uh, i've been heard holding this inverse s p share thing for months i just don't understand why the market is going up i can't believe the market is going up well that's the old don't confuse the issue with facts thing and if you look at the market we've got a global pandemic we got blood in the streets, literally. We have the highest unemployment since the Great Depression. And then there's Twitter wars and scandals and insert your favorite mess here. And what has the market done? It has climbed so far the wall of worry. And by the way, just in case you don't know, if you hold on to those inverse shares, even if the market does go down, unless the market does go down considerably. Keep in mind, they're just they're just tracking the day change, okay? They're not trying, if you go to the website and look at their prospectuses, if that's a word, they'll tell you flat out, this is not something to capture a longer term price move. This is just to capture a very short term move and ideally just like a day trade type of move. And that's what they're designed for. So that in and of itself, can cause problems if you do the math a market goes up one percent then down one percent it's got to go back up more than one percent to regain that percent it's lost just like if a market loses half its value it's got to come back 200 percent i'm sorry 100 percent. if it loses 50 percent of its value it has to come back 100 percent. so that's how all that math works and the other thing is there all, there's also frictional costs, or I guess you'd call it tracking errors and all. So holding those longer term is just, a, in general, a bad idea. Now, as I often preach, you have to believe in what you see and not in what you believe. I might have gotten a little too caught up in this pandemic and everything else, I'm a bit of a germaphobe, <laughs> you know, and it's like, but somehow the market has just gone up. So this is something I preach over and over again, believe in what you see and not in what you believe. Now, speaking of believe in what you see and not in what you believe, take a look at this NASDAQ. Obviously, we had this huge sell-off, and then we've come all the way back up, and we'll measure it in just one second. And I know we weakened a little bit earlier, but so far, so good. Now, my only concern, as I preach, is when a market makes a V-shaped recovery at high levels, it's overbought by the time it reaches its old highs. Whereas if something bottoms out forever, then it begins to rally, it has a long ways to go or could potentially have a long ways to go. So that's the only thing that has me concerned about the NASDAQ. But hey, you know, there's a potential 
for some FOMO in here. And a FOMO is going to occur if the NASDAQ hits new highs and stays there for a while. I think a lot of people will be forced in. I try not to watch much news, although my wife would argue against that, just because I put on the TV when I go in the house and she'll have to come home right after or come home and the channel's still on or whatever. But I really don't watch that much news. But I do get a little bit through osmosis. And I saw where some hedge fund guy was fighting the market. And these guys, I don't get it. They 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 manage billions of dollars and they just need to learn what is is. And yeah, I'm wrong sometimes because I get a little too bearish, probably, admittedly. But I think it was Livermore and plenty of other people that has that have said it's okay to be wrong, but it's bad to stay wrong. Paraphrasing them. I'm sure they said it a little bit in a little bit more eloquent manner than that. Now, one thing I've been talking about, and John Lewis, I couldn't remember his name in, in weeks prior, just get once the uh, camera starts rolling, I, it's you know, everything kind of goes blank sometimes. But anyways, John Lewis. Super nice guy. He works for Dorsey Wright, which is now part of the NASDAQ. And he gave a really good speech in San Francisco last fall. I was also speaking at the TSAASF conference, Technical Analysis of San Francisco conference. And anyway, he talked about how the momentum stocks began to weaken and the he called them value stocks and i think that's probably a that's probably a good way of putting it the value stocks begin to strengthen and one thing he pointed out is that if you if you never want to make any money in the markets then you put half your money in a growth fund and half your money in a value fund and the two will sort of counteract each other so if you take a look at like the landry list from yesterday and if you're watching this in a couple of days, those archives will be available on that archive screen. But you can see that Macy's took off yesterday and continues to rally, obviously, today. Now, this is one of those big department stores, which everybody has called down and out or called dead, I guess, after all this mess. And now you can see it's now begun to come back. Now, this is a healthcare REIT type of stock. What's going to happen with real estate? Well, real estate's all going to hell, right? Well, you can see it had a huge rally yesterday out of a bow tie like, cup and handle like pattern. Now, just for S and G's, I went in and I looked at this one and some other ones, and without using my actual money management just because it was for S and G's and fun. I thought it'd be cool to say, okay, what, ha what would happen if we took an entry one cent of our prior day's high and then exit on the close because all these low level stocks took off. And instead of figuring out where our stop would be in the money management based on the stop, like we normally do, I was like, well, what would happen if you invested, so to speak, $10,000 in each one of these stocks? And this one went up. Three, would you'd have made three thousand three hundred twenty-five dollars, and here's the rest of those trades based on every bow tie or bottoming pattern mentioned yesterday or day before yesterday, and this was yesterday's performance, so to speak, on those stocks. Now I didn't actually do this, but it was kind of interesting. I was sort of chasing my own tail studying some of this intraday stuff, intraday trend following, and placing a bunch of trades in the market, a bunch of day trades, which I probably shouldn't be doing, but I'm testing out something lately. And I made $158. And if I'd have taken the same system, so to speak, and applied it to these stocks that I actually recommended, or mentioned, I should say, not a direct recommendation, I would have made six thousand dollars, <laughs> or maybe even more, because I'm just assuming just a ten thousand dollar round number in each one. So anyway, it reminds me of the guy who traveled the world looking for diamonds, sold everything, and then the guy who bought his property found a big old diamond 
in the backyard in the stream. He was out there doing whatever he was doing. Saw a big old diamond glistening and come to find out there were acres of diamonds on this guy's property. So just, it just he'd only looked at his backyard. I haven't read this book, but I, I just saw it this morning. I was trying to Google to find the story. So this, I think, is the original. Since then, there's been a couple of redos or other books with the same title. So I ordered this book this morning. I'm going to see if it's worth reading. It looks like it's kind of like one of those motivational things. But anyway. Now, getting back to the leaders and laggards, here's the drugs. You can see longer term, they're still in an uptrend, but over the short to intermediate term, they have lost a little steam. Now, the good news is I'm still seeing some pretty cool setups in the drugs and some pretty cool setups in the biotechs. Speaking of biotechs, you can see biotechs, nice little rally there, but they have lost a little steam as of late, and they're a little weak today at the present time i'm i'm long labd full disclosure but longer term i'm still bullish on these guys but we're going to have to pay attention pay attention to see if these laggards become leaders now along those i'm sorry leaders become laggards now along those lines last couple of weeks i've been talking about the fact that zoom which has gone pretty much straight up throughout this pandemic obviously has lost a lot of steam and sort of made the mother of all head and shoulders tops. But what, is, what has it done lately? Well, it's taken off, today notwithstanding, obviously, and banged out new highs. By the way, I've seen this happen before, and I noticed that somebody, it might be Thorpe or someone, calls it the Hounds of the Baskerville signal. And the Hounds of the Baskerville story is that the dogs didn't bark for the intruder who killed someone on the property. So they realized that it had to be an inside job. Well, he, he names this pattern when you have like a failed head and shoulder or something, the hounds of the Baskerville, I guess because it looks like it's gonna roll over, but it tricks everybody. And instead it goes straight up. So the point I'm trying to make, or hopefully trying to make, is that the leaders, could become laggards, but so far that hasn't happened. So what I'm hoping for, and I know you should never say hope in this business, but I'm hoping that for at least a little while, momentum will remain momentum and then value, for lack of a better word, those things that are making bow ties at super low levels will also rally. So we could have our cake and eat it too, at least for a little while. Now, last week I talked about pioneer patterns in IPOs and talked about the buy at B pattern in GAN and one, two, three, four, five, new closing high. This is the buy at B. And again, there's quite a few caveats, like I said last week, but as a general statement, you're buying that new closing high after you have at least one week of trading. And there was a little confusion with this pattern. And I think because of my earlier research i didn't realize that it actually could also trigger on day five or i didn't make that abundantly clear for those who look at the q a on my website i've, I've cleared out the cleared up the buy b quite a bit so read those if you get a chance or watch those if you get a chance but anyway it can trigger on day five and basically again with some caveats you're just looking for a five day i'm sorry a new closing high for the life of the IPO, but you can't actually take the trade until the close of day five. And it also has to be above the high of day one, if that high sets the new high for the week. So if on day one, the stock takes off and then day two and day three and day four are below that high, or even day two is below that high, you also, the market also has to close at a new closing high and above the high of day one. So in this particular case, that rule didn't necessarily apply, but it was also still above the high of day one. So you buy market on close. It can really be a leap of faith, as I often say, especially if you get the signal on a Friday afternoon. It's like you buy a stock and then you're like, okay, well, uh, I guess I'll wait two days to see if I was stupid or not, right? And this one failed miserably. And like I said last week, I dropped F-bomb after F-bomb after F-bomb when that happened. 
But something interesting happened. We, number one, started talking about it again in the Facebook group as it begun to improve. And somebody asked me, hey, Dave, it's a new closing high again, or close to a new closing high, I should say, around the 23rd of May. And they're like, should I buy it if it closes at a new closing high? But on the close, and I'm like, no, why don't we wait to see if we have a little bit momentum on that? And the momentum being the low greater than the moving average. This is a five day moving average. And I don't have a good name for this little five day IPO system. Mike, if you're in here, Mike P, what did you call this? Maybe I'll, I'll call it that IPO Go or something. So it's hard to go back to the well especially after you just got creamed. And, and you know what? Even if you make money on a trade and get stopped out at a profit, it's hard to go back a second time because you feel like you're tempting fate. And as I often preach, psychology is, is a bitch, for lack of a better word, in this business. And that's why I get so upset with these, these uh, false profits out there, profits, P-R-O-F-I-T-S, that just claim that trading is so easy if it was easy if if it were as easy as they make it you would never see my fat arse again so with the buy it b we're not worried about a moving average or anything because it wouldn't mean anything because we don't have enough days at least in early in the setup but i wanted to come up with something that would a wouldn't allow you to trade it until at least the close of day five and in most charting packages it won't come out it won't plot until day six and that's fine. I just wanted something when uh, I think it was um, it wasn't Chewy.com that came out, but it was it was uh, Blue Apron and Snapchat and a few. I think it was Snapchat. So I just kind of noodled around a little bit and says, well, let me come up with a system that you can't argue that you could get in, okay, earlier than the first week of trading. I was like, well, what if I put a moving average in? That would solve that problem because if one of the rules was you had to have daylight or Landry light, I should say, above the moving average. Well, if there's no moving average on the chart because it hasn't made enough days or there's not enough days for the moving average to begin to plot, then you couldn't take the setup. So anyway, so what I was saying again was when somebody said, hey, Dave, we're closing in our new closing highs, it worth a second shot. And I said, let's wait until we have some Landry light above the five-day moving average. And it's at a new closing high. That's supposed to be NCH there. Well, that's what it's supposed to look like. And you can see here we have Landry light, the lows above the moving average. So if a stock or any other market for that matter can have Landry light on a five-day moving average, it suggests that it's breaking out or breaking away from the moving average. And I'm just kind of seeing this as I'm showing you, but notice here it intersects and then here it intersects and intersects here, 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 here. And finally, the low is greater than the moving average as the stock begins to accelerate. So your new buy would be on that close around 16 and a half. And again, we also have Landry light and I took partial profits at this level here. I have a trailing stop at break even for now. And that probably should be a little tighter than break even, but that's about where I have it. I don't actually have a hard stop in today. So, but if I did, I would make sure that I wouldn't lose money on the second low for this trade. And so far, so good. Knock on wood on that. So sometimes it's hard to go back to the well. I just want to follow up on the example, especially since it did hit the initial profit target. Here's the thing. Trading can be a really lonely sport. And by accident, I discovered something absolutely wonderful. I decided to start a group of traders and make that part of my membership area. And this thing has really taken off. And these guys, most of you are here today live. Thank you so much. You guys have been a godsend for me. I really enjoyed interacting with you. And I'm not the grand poobah. Sometimes you guys don't agree with me or we agree to disagree, but that's okay. And I've learned a lot from you guys in the process. And if you're newer to trading, a lot of people email me and ask me a bunch of questions. Well, one, 
once you're a member, I'm willing to bet that 99% of all those questions have been answered either in a Q&A or in the four member courses, the mind course or trading psychology, the money management course, the methodology course, and then the holistic trader, which is a little bit of both because I believe that those three cannot be separated. But anyway, ask for help in the group. And to my surprise, by the time I get around to answering the question, a lot of you guys, guys in a group, have chimed in and answered it. And the other thing you do is you can see the signs and signals as they occur. And occasionally I'll throw out an opening gap reversal and some other trades there. So check that out. And you can go to this URL or the shorter URL you can go to davelander.com slash members. All right, let's go to live charts. A couple things I want to look at real quick. Last week we talked about doing a relative strength sort based on the S&P 500 and looking at the major MIGs, MIGs or Morningstar industry groups. And you can see those are over here. I mean, I've got a few other things on here. So let's plot the S&P 500. And we can pick any period you want, but let's let's take a look at this. Let's go for the bottom of this range, and I'm not sure what it's gonna produce, but, so let's just do it on the fly. So for the bottom of the range, the top of the range, 9% run, let's see what has done better than the market and what has done worse than the market. Well, the market has ran, again, 9% and change. So anything above the S&P 500, based on this sort is stronger than the market. And anything below the S&P 500 is weaker than the market. Now, this is pretty amazing because what's one of the strongest areas out there? Retail, okay? Well, retail is actually below the performance of the S&P 500, which I find amazing. What's one of the weaker areas? Well, defense. You've got a lot of these stocks that have just been beaten up in here, and now it's becoming one of the stronger areas. What's another area that's been beaten up really bad? Banks, okay? Transports. I was looking at transports last night. I'm like, holy moly, look at these transports. They're acting like a momentum stock, okay? What else? Leisure. Well, what good's a leisure stock, right? We're all stuck inside with this pandemic. Nobody's going anywhere. Well, Leisure stocks during that same period have gone up 21%. So you can kind of go through these and pick them all apart. Real estate, real estate's been left for dead, right? Real estate coming back strong. So we're definitely seeing a big sector rotation. But again, what I'm hoping, I don't know, I should never use the word hope, blah, blah, blah. What I'm hoping is the stronger areas in here are like biotech, which is only up 2% on that same period, remain strong longer term okay let's take a look at some of these sectors real quick and then we'll pop out to the we'll take a look at the overall market too so live update on the overall market as you can see a little weak today not the end of the world we're really due for a correction we've had a pretty good run in here again that's what nine percent or so so we're due for a little bit of a retracement in here let's take a look at nasdaq as you can see not too far from all-time highs yesterday i think it was like two percent and change let's see yeah less than a half percent at yesterday's close okay wow that's pretty amazing now we're a little bit further down because the market has slid a little as you know let's take a look at the rusty now the rusty was up two percent and change very impressive obviously giving up some of that in here the great thing about the rusty is it did break out of this range which it was stuck into stuck in for quite a while so that's certainly a good thing let's take a look at gold the commodity speaking of leaders becoming laggards okay gold up a little today but you could see the moving averages are beginning to come together here and we could have a bow tie in the gold commodity itself but take a look at the gold stocks the gold stocks are beginning to break down this morning notwithstanding i had nem on the landry list i think it was yesterday and it began to break down a little bit yeah you can see it broke down from this 
first thrust type of setup. Gold, G-O-L-D, these big thick gold stocks look like they could be in a little bit of trouble. We had a first thrust here, okay? Bit of a pioneer type of setup. And like the American pioneers, you're either gonna get the gold, no pun intended, or the arrows in your back. And you know, here's the thing, I, I, I should probably write an article, do the scary thing. If there's any lesson from this bear market is do the scary thing and you might look stupid doing it. That, that would probably be a good title for an article. Do the scary thing in the parentheses and you might look pretty stupid doing it. <laughs> but the scary thing right now would be to short gold. I know, that's crazy. Why would you short gold when there's a global pandemic when there's blood in the streets, okay? It's crazy, I know. What else is happening? Energy is another one of those areas left for dead. Negative 39.70, I think, oil. <laughs> you know, free oil. Not only free oil, we'll pay you $40 a barrel to take it off our hands. And what happened? Well, oil's going up. Don't confuse the issue with facts. Real estate, another one of those areas, again, kind of a value area, so to speak, improving as you can see. Drugs that we just said, losing a little bit of steam in here. I wouldn't count them down and out just yet. You know, maybe throw that 10% line in there or something just to make sure you stay on the right side of the market. Retail, although it's lost a little steam based on that little relative strength sort we just did, as you can see, those moving averages, look how cool that is. I know, such a nerd. You probably want to party with me, I know. But look how cool the both side moving averages are. Look at this slope on these things. And look how orderly that has been. Due to correct, but pretty cool and orderly nonetheless. And then look at what happened with this bow tie here. This was a beautiful bow tie. And then retail just absolutely imploded. That's pretty cool stuff. Let's take a look at the semiconductors today, notwithstanding. But as you can see, bow ties, proper moving, I'm sorry, proper order. The 10s above the 20, 20s above the 30, nice uptrends intact. Also, like I just said, nice little slope in these guys, okay? You know, maybe that's another, some fodder for research or something, like how many days of slope do you have in the bow tie moving averages? And that would be a, probably a good little thing to analyze. Anyway, I think that's pretty much enough for the sectors and all. You guys wanna talk about individual issues, start bringing them up now. THM, all right, Steve, good to see you, Steve. THM. Okay, THM, obviously a gold stock. I would say the HV is crazy, but everything has a crazy HV. I'm sorry, Elizabeth, I was busy. I didn't get to it. I, I appreciate you sending those though. Elizabeth's kind enough to send me the setups that she wants to talk about ahead of time. And I always forget to check my emails right before the thing. So if you could do me a favor and cut and paste that here, I'll be happy to take a look at them. I would wait for a pullback in the THM. I'm not really nuts about, it's kind of weird. Longer term, I'm a gold bug. As a kid, I used to be a gold bug. I actually wanted my dad to buy some gold. And I, I remember I would get him on all these brokers call lists and it aggravated him, but I think he enjoyed the fact that I was interested in something constructive like that. But anyway, I digress. Um, I would wait for a pullback on this one. Obviously, super volatile, obviously penny stock. So it would need quite the pullback. Uh, maybe it's, believe it or not, down below $1 a share before it would be, it would pull back enough. But yeah, by all means, put that on your watch list. It has okay volume, but 85000 for a $1 stock is not a tremendous amount of volume. Uh, you know, if you, <laughs> technically a, a fairly small trader could be 100% of the day's volume. So yeah, put it on your watch list, but it's not ready yet. It needs to pull back a little bit. A little bit. ABMD, a oops, ABMD. Yeah, that's in a really nice trend. And you know what else, Ed? I like the fact that it's accelerating higher. Let's back the chart out. See if there's any bad memories. Oh, lo and behold, what do we have? Well, first of all, of all, you've got a big gap down. Now I know that was a ways back. But still, markets have long memories. So whoever got whacked 
on that. Might be looking to get out right about now. And then whoever held through this base might be looking to get out. So I think there's too much good looking momentum stocks out there right now. It hopefully will flesh out a few here in a few minutes. So I would go after those stocks and avoid anything that has overhead supply. And if you want to buy something at lower levels, there's actually some biotechs that are at lower levels that are bottoming out. So do your research, do your homework, and you should be able to find them. I, I can't tell you which ones they are because out of courtesy of my clients, there are a few of those that are at low level that are on the uh, lander list today. And then also there's a lot at, at high levels. Okay, you look at a weekly bow tie. Okay, well, it's gonna probably be the same thing on a weekly bow tie. Daily looks fantastic, Ed. Weekly. Yeah, it's a little bit more obvious. You're coming right into this big pile of overhead supply. So I would hold off on that one. There's just so much better out there. Didn't the NASDAQ hit an all-time high today? I don't know. But keep in mind that I'm measuring uh, closing. No, I don't think so. It doesn't look like it. No, it didn't. Yeah, no, it would have to be above... But yeah, close enough, huh? Getting pretty close. It had to be above 98.39. So getting there. Love. Okay, now that's going to be what? An airline? I bet you 100 bucks it's bottoming out. Look at that. Look at that stock. It's huge. Okay, now this looks interesting. Let's see what bad memories are. You got bad memories at 55. You know what? That's far enough away. But it needs a pullback, obviously. So you've got your pullback. I'm sorry, you got your bow tie. And look how beautiful that bow tie is. Look at that bow tie. It's beautiful. All right. So I feel like tiny, tiny Elvis here. So yeah, on a pullback, maybe if you just pull back to like 35 or so. Because remember, with these transitional patterns, we're just looking for a tiny bow tie. But yeah, absolutely. Let's take a look at Jets, which is the ETF for Jets. Had a distant family member call me. Wanted to buy jets like way up here because they thought it was a bargain. I'm like, no, <laughs> wait for them to bottom out. But now she might be right. Okay. We had a nice little bottom in here. It wasn't quite a bow tie there, but sort of saucer and handily. Now you got the bow tie. So in the first little pullback. Now, <laughs> you know, I used to joke about the airlines and say that my trading system there is wait for them to go up and then short them. But I might have to change that too. It's kind of interesting that Warren Buffett allegedly, or not allegedly, it was a joke that he was going to pay somebody. I think it was a joke. He was going to pay somebody, and his sole job was to not let him ever buy an airline again. And this book was 10 years old that I was reading. And obviously, he bought airlines recently and dumped them all. And that's probably why they're bottoming out now. PODD is a short PODD. Uh, a little bit on the thin side for shorting. Let's back on the short out. But yeah, I hear you. You've got the reversal gap strategy kind of setting up here, kind of a stealthy setup back there. And then you've had a little sell off and a little pullback and sort of a bow tie. Yeah, absolutely. That stock looks like it's in a lot of trouble. It looks like it would already have triggered. Usually I don't like shorts with a lot of trading below the market like this. So it might have some trouble in there. I'm not extremely excited about shorting just yet, but if some of these stocks at high levels begin to roll over, like this one here, I might be tempted. But for, as a general statement, CJ, I'm going to agree with you on this one. I wouldn't personally take it just because it's got a little trading below. But keep in mind, I do tend to, I do tend to pick things apart sometimes to my detriment. DKNG. Now there's one that's going straight up. When do we start? Somebody in the group talked about the return to paradise pattern where you just basically wait for a stock to go straight up and then when it goes back down and then breaks out of the base or whatever it makes, you buy it again, which has been working amazingly well so far this year. I don't know if that's a longer term thing, but it's been pretty amazing so far this year. Who's talking about that in the group? I get we got so many Chris's that get I call everybody Chris. <laughs> Yeah, this one looks really good, but I would wait for a pullback, and it's going to take one serious pullback, like maybe down to 35 or so, okay, before I would go after that one. But yeah, absolutely, that's on my watch list. All right, George is watching ERVI. Let's take a look at that for George. I'm sorry, EVRI. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Let's see. 
Um, it looks okay. You've got a lot of overhead supply at 12, but if you got in somewhere around here and you roll it up to 12, you'd probably be pretty happy. Maybe on a pullback. It just doesn't, I'm not seeing the momentum. It's kind of drifting in here a little bit. I don't know. Let's let's we'll know when we see it. Let's wait for it to set up. I think on the long side, on those bow tie type of setups, something like Macy's, which you know, here's the thing. I guess I'm mad at myself for missing these. And I guess I was kind of thinking that I'm gonna have plenty of time to get in. And I just I'm just here's the thing in this business, you could always do better. And even on good days, I beat myself up a lot. And I think that's okay, you know. <laughs> but I would much rather stocks that are kind of bottomed out like this that look like they can come flying off of their lows and they have no overhead supply for a long, long ways, okay? But yeah, that one looks like it, it has bottomed out. G Pro for Elizabeth. G Pro. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Let's see what's happening. A uh, little choppy trading longer term, a little wide and loose longer term, but it does look pretty good over the intermediate term, I have to say. Maybe wait for a little bit more pullback. So that one's, that, I'm going to give that one a not bad. ROK is going to be Rockwell International, I think. Rockwell Automation. It used to be Rockwell International, huh? Let's back the chart out a little bit. It does have a little bit of electrocardiogram look to it longer term, but we've had such a crazy bear market, a quick bear market, I should say. I'm not as worried about those patterns as I used to be, the longer term wide and loose trading that is. It looks okay. Let's see what happens on a pullback. It didn't really blast past these prior highs in here. I'm going to pass because it really didn't get past these prior highs. If it accelerates higher and pulls back, maybe, okay? Oh, good. Ed said he's waiting for a pullback. Fantastic. Stuart wants to talk about Alec. Alec is okay. I prefer a cup and handles. I know years ago I talked about the running cup and handle. Let me just SNG see what a 50 would be. But that pattern seems to work a lot better in bull markets. No, it's not really there. I used to like cup and handles that formed around the 50 day moving average, but now I like the cup and handle, the bow tie, and things like that at very, very low levels. It's slightly on the thin side. Let's back the chart out a little bit. It looks okay. I'm just not a big fan, again, of these, at least in more recent years, last 15 years or so, of these patterns that set up right at the prior highs. I would prefer if it broke out to new highs and then look to play pullbacks. You are welcome, George. TDOC for CJ. TDOC looks like it's in trouble. Let's see, he's on your watch list. Yeah, it does look like it's in trouble. Um, this one, it's kind of interesting. There's a couple little health service related stocks in here that are beginning to stall out a little bit. It's a little wide and loose, but boy, that certainly looks like kind of a, a rounded top in here. And I think I drew this in last week on a net net basis. It hadn't made forward progress in quite a while. I'm not seeing any structure unless you would have shorted it a few days ago. But yeah, I hear you and your bow ties are rolling over. Yeah, this stock looks like it's in a lot of trouble. So good eye on that one. Yeah, we talked about Alec, okay, for Stuart. I was, I was gonna, I was hoping you were gonna talk about Warren Buffett today. <laughs> uh, what's this, what's the stock, Berkshire? How do you spell it? Or uh, how do you, um, I can never remember the symbol, Berkshire, B-R-K. You know, that's the thing too. If he's such a value guy, why did he sell all his airlines, you know? Don't get me started. Berkshire, B-R-K-A, okay. You know, I mean, he's the, what do they call him? The Wizard of Omaha or whatever? Well, let's plot the S&P 500 below that. And I shouldn't pick on this poor gentleman. I just think, oops, I don't want to do that. I just think those days are over. Comparison simple, 500, okay. And yellow. Yeah, I think I talked about this last week. Okay, so what happens? Market goes down. Okay. Good. What's his name? Mr. Mackey. I had to quit watching South Park when I got married because my wife had a young child. 
but you can see S&P 500 green line doing pretty good and uh, Berkshire Hathaway not so much now these lines aren't to scale but you can see it pretty much mimics the overall market if the market goes down 30 percent so does he let's see what his slide was lately I know you just goading me on this let's see uh yeah, 30%. So market goes down 30%. He goes down 30%. Anyway. Now, I recently read a book going back. This book's about 10 years old. It's called Investor's Brain. I recommend you read it. Go to www.davelander.com slash books dash two dash read. And I'll get uh, like 10 cents if you buy a book there per book. I'll toss in the plate or I'll put it back to I'll put it towards my website data feeds or whatever. Anyway, they were talking about how his performance really isn't that great, and that was 10 years ago. They also talked about the guy who screams on TV. Why is it spread so wide on the EEX June options contracts? Well, because it's a low price issue, and uh, because the volume isn't huge, okay? Okay, so think about this, Zach. The volume is... 300,000 shares on average. This is one from today's Landry list. Since it appears to have triggered, we can talk about it. And this is another one of those stocks that's bottoming out, right? They do trade shows or something, according to Yahoo. Yahoo. So it's 300,000 shares in this stock. And let's say, I don't know how many strikes there are, but you start dividing up all the strikes, calls and puts, and by month and month and month, it gets diluted way, 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 way out. It's not like a spider contract where it trades millions of shares. So look at the volume on those options and you'll get your answer to that. And if you just think about it logically, again, you know, you divide 300,000 on average by all those different contracts and it's gonna be like, <laughs> ridiculously low numbers and, and keep in mind that just because there's that many shares it doesn't mean it's, it divide that by 100 first this number by 100 because each contract is 100 shares and then divide it out by all those different contracts probably like 100 contracts okay svc bowtie trying let's take a look at that svc yeah it looks pretty good um you know here here we go what is a reit a retail reit okay Brick and mortar, does brick and mortar exist anymore? Well, maybe not after all these riots, but you know, after the pandemic, I, th I think people are gonna actually, this is just my gut, I think people are gonna appreciate the brick and mortar stores. They're gonna wanna go out and walk, wanna go walk around stores. Yeah, I mean, that looks good. You're breaking out of this low level base. Let's throw those bow ties in there. Look at that, you got the bow ties, gonna bow tie real soon. On a pullback, little overhead supply 22, who gives a flip, right? If we make it to 22, We'll be pretty happy. So yeah, on a pullback. Good job. First, I have a question about entries. The example of OCFT. Somehow my alert didn't work, so I came in yesterday morning to find that the setup had triggered the day before at 14. Okay, OCFT. This was on the trading service. Entry of 14. I am long this stock. This is the best. By the way, this is the best looking stock in the world. Go ahead and mortgage your your house and and just put all that money into this stock. Obviously, I'm kidding, <laughs> but I am long this stock, okay? Somehow my alert didn't work, so I came in yesterday morning to find that it set up and triggered the day before at 14. OCFT had closed at 402, so I thought I might still enter, but then it opened slightly higher, like 1422, went up for a while, took it, and went back to 1423 to close. So all yesterday morning, I was asking myself, should I enter at 1422, 1438? Well, first of all, if something like this takes off and you miss it and it comes back in, then maybe do a re-entry above like a pivot high or something, okay? Uh, if I miss a setup, I look to re-enter on some sort of strength. Unless, unless this is the only caveat, and I don't recommend you rush out and do this, but let's say I'm, I'm busy doing the weekend charts and I forget to put an order in for a stock that I have on my Landry list, I'm sorry, on my trading service, which would also be in the Landry list. And let's say it triggers at 14 or whatever, and it triggers and then it comes back in. 
I might actually go in and buy that stock just so I could take a position in the stock. But what I would recommend you do is just look to maybe enter above this high and don't stress yourself out so much if you do miss that initial entry and provided the stock doesn't take off again or doesn't take off after, after you miss entry. Now, I get this question all the time. Hey, Dave, you, you're long these stocks in the portfolio and I'm just coming in service. Should I buy them? And the answer is no. Only buy something if it sets up again, just like the stock I took the IPO I talked about earlier I got in I got knocked out well I don't want to just jump back in because it starts going up again I want to wait until it sets up again yeah you'll make yourself crazy if you try to think of too many different scenarios so you have to come up with like okay I'm going to buy it if it sets up again or if it's still set up okay and you don't necessarily want to try to beat the system so if this thing begins to implode god forbid <laughs> then just avoid the stock altogether. But yeah, come up with a place where you'll get in maybe a little bit later, like above this pivot high or in some kind of strength, and then don't overthink it too much. And yeah, don't buy it on weakness. Good question though. A lot of stocks bottoming and starting to go up. Yeah, BBBV, that's gonna be a BBB. Let me see if I gotta put a, um, I just gotta fill on something. Let me see what's happening. Hopefully it was good, Phil. All right, had an order left over from this morning's ogres that triggered. I had forgotten about it. Game. <laughs> Docu. Yeah, Docu's starting to look pretty good. You know, you can't argue with that trend. I think this knockout here, we had it on the list, and I wanted it to be a little bit bigger. And, you know, look at me, looking for perfection. Missed a pretty good trade, but it, it could have been a little bit bigger. So, yeah, I like a pullback or a bit of a knockout move in here. But, uh, yeah, I think that looks... Interesting. Oh, you think it looks in trouble? Okay, well, we'll have to watch it. Oh, T Doc. T Doc looks like it's in trouble. Okay. Doc U. Yeah, Doc U is for Stewart. That looks okay. T Doc. Did we look at T Doc already? Okay, a lot of stocks bottoming out. AMWD. AMWD. American Woodmark. Home Furnishing. Now, this is kind of a thin stock, but it is a higher price stock. Yeah, I just don't like the longer term action in this a whole lot. I mean, there's just a lot of the stocks out there right now that you could probably trade. Okay, BBBV, that's going to be a beverage company, right? BBBV, BBV, oh, BBBY, BBBY. It's going to be another brick and mortar. Yeah, you know, Elizabeth, you're onto something here with these brick and mortars, uh, certainly bottoming out. But yeah, that looks kind of interesting. Let's, but see, now it's more of a transitional pattern. It, it would have to rally up and then on a pullback, and you've got a little gap back here. It looks okay. Let's, we'll have to, follow up on that one but yeah certainly if you're building a case for stocks bottoming out gap now this is a pretty good looking one you can see you kind of have the bow tie here so on your first little bow tie was actually here so your next little pullback it might be worth a shot it does have some overhead supply a whole mountain of it up here to contend with i would actually pass on that one based on that but yeah building your case for brick and mortar retail i think this gap is still brick and mortar correct by all means it's bottoming out Okay, GNRC, that's going to be what, Generac? <laughs> I was told I wouldn't need a generator here, and it's like <laughs> a friend of mine who works on here for 20 years, like, you're going to need a generator, so might be my next purchase. It looks okay. It's that cup and handle at high levels thing I talked about. I just prefer something up in clear air, but it, it it's not a bad looking stock. A little bit of a gap here. I think there's better stocks out there, but I couldn't fault you too much for that one, Stuart. Not bad. PRLB, PRLB. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Now that's, see, that's, let me just see. I was going to try to find a stock to illustrate my point. Well, this is way back there. We might be okay. But, you know, over the last couple of years, you're in clear air. So now you got a stock that's broken out past the prior peaks and pulling back. So that looks a lot better than GNRK. Maybe just a tiny bit more pullback, but that's not bad. Now, it is a little bit on the thin side, but you multiply this times the price, and it's it's fairly, it's liquid enough to trade, obviously. MRNA. That was an interesting over the other day. I, I think I would pass on this one longer term. It looks like it could be in the early phases of being in trouble. It's a little dangerous to short a stock like this, a headline stock, so to speak. I think I would pass. But yeah, I think it's actually in the early phase. You know, about a week ago, I thought it looked a lot better. 
I liked it when it had this big down day. If you remember, it was on the Landry list, and the next day it gapped down, nice little opening gap reversal type of play. It didn't really work out, though, at least for me. Let me know if it worked out for anybody else. Because what happened was, and this is something that I want to kind of bounce off of you guys in the group. I wonder if I can get enough. Um, when you have these opening gap reversals, and I did – I did play it early and lost money and got stopped out. I bought in here and got stopped out here, but I did buy again when it was headed back higher. So I just want to kind of think about this. We can talk about it in the group later, but on these opening gap reversals, what do you think about when they bottom out, especially after they fake out like this and then take off again? I didn't mitigate all my loss, all my losses, but it made back quite a bit. So in other words, a gap down and then they continue down and then look to uh, get long. The other thing I was thinking about too, we talk about it every now and then, it's the gap and go. So two questions on the opening gap reversals to think about is let's say, maybe I can draw it in over here. Okay, let's say you've got an opening gap like this. Trade number one, obviously be like the opening gap reversal, but sometimes they gap down and keep on going. Is it worth playing that gap? Okay, and then the next thing is if they bottom out intraday at much, much lower levels, is it worth playing that reversal back up? So that's something I'm thinking about. You know, the problem with all that trading is you don't want to end up chasing your own tail. But that's something I've been meaning to discuss with you guys in the group to get you two cents on that. All right, let's take a look at some of these other stocks in here. Crocs? Well, certainly in an uptrend, okay? Lots of bad memories, okay? Just all this trading up here. Again, find something in clear air. GES. GES. Don't make me guess what stock this is. I saw a woman biscuit tire 300. She had on guess jeans. Is it 300? 301? I said guess. I'm like, eh, 300? 305? I don't know where I stole that joke from. Yeah, breaking out of this range in here. Uh, maybe if you could break out and then on a the pullback. It does have a lot of bad memories, but those are a long ways away. HSII, HSII. Now that's why I'm losing sideways. Let it break out of that range before doing anything. KALU. Yeah, same thing there, a little sideways. There was another aluminum stock I was looking at recently. Was it aluminium or was it something else? Let me find you something might look a little better. Yeah, watch that one, but wait for the breakout. It was Alcoa. Okay, so Alcoa. You see, you had this bow tie here, you got this one little pullback, and then so far it's kind of come flying out of this space. Another one of those value stocks, so to speak, beginning to take off. Well, next pullback here might be worth a shot. And usually I'm a little bit more lenient in these uh, IPOs. So yeah, KL, KALU, keep it on your watch list, but don't take any action until you see some upside follow through. Yeah, this is breaking out of the range in another one of those areas that's been beaten up pretty bad or badly. I met a neighbor in a food business and he was telling me how horrible it is and how they can't get supply and, and everything. And But that might be the blood in the streets. So it's kind of interesting that they're bottoming out. What is, is. So yeah, there's your bow tie, a little bit of a pullback maybe. And uh, that could work, sure. And you got a ways to go to uh, to that overhead supply. So that's not bad, Chris. A little stealthy setup, huh? ACGL. We did well on the short side. Now, yeah, I, I was looking at it last night or night before, and it it's it's definitely improving. This is one we rode down, as Chris is pointing out from right here, one of my biggest shorts of the year, if not the biggest short. And then what I did was when it got, I think, down here one day, I went ahead and bailed out and bought a bunch of put options, or a few put options, I guess. And then they failed miserably for a while, but then when it sold off again, I was able to cash out. Something like that. I can look at the trades and figure out what I did. Yeah, you know, you've got the bow ties formed, it's pulled back, it's rallying out the bow tie. Maybe on the next little pullback, it might be worth a shot. But there's another case in point. The insurance companies have been really beat up during all this mess, but now what are they doing? They're, they, it's Everything gets overdone, right? It gets overdone to the downside, overdone to the upside, so now they're beginning to bottom out. 
Another one, he's laggards becoming a leader. Okay. Anything else? While we're at impasse, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of the busy schedule to be here. I appreciate you being here. If there's anything unanswered, obviously we could pick it up in Facebook, or if you're not in the group, we could pick it up next week. You're welcome, Zach. Zach's is a great show. All right, we've got a couple of last minute things. When swing trading, does stocks correlation with the S&P have any impact? It all depends, okay? It all depends. Sometimes you have really, really tight correlation. And a lot of the intraday research I've been doing, sometimes you're looking at these different ETFs and it, they almost mirror the S&P 500 or the spiders, which I plot right, right next to them. So yeah, ideally you want the market to go in the same direction. Commodity related areas, aluminum, gold, can sometimes trade contra the overall market. The biotechs obviously trade co traded contra the overall market based on the situation because it's kind of more of an event driven environment. So yeah, ideally you want the market to be headed in the same way as your stocks are headed. And you, you obviously want the sector behind you too, ideally, and then stocks within the sector behind you. But a lot of time it's hard to get all those things setting up. Tzu, I like the name, Tzo. Yeah, it looks kind of like it's bottomed out a little bit in here. We do have some, it's a little on the thin side. You got a really big old mount. I would probably pass, believe it or not, even though it's way up here at 10, I would pass based on that mountain of overhead resistance and try to find something that's a little bit more, a little more momentum maybe and a little less overhead supply. And WLK. Yeah, you've got a lot of overhead supply in this one, Elizabeth. So I pass on that. OPRA, PRA. You guys go out and get some water and come back. <laughs> Y'all went to pee or something and came back. Uh just too much, just too much bad memories above the market. I hear you though. Let's take a look at it short term. Shorter term, I should say. Shorter term, it looks okay. You made a bow tie, you pull back a little bit. You've got a big old cup and handle. Oops. You got a big old cup and handle, but I would pass on that. Okay. Well, once again, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I'll see all you guys and girls in the Facebook group. And if you're not a member, I'll see you again, hopefully, next week. Thank you guys and girls so much.